the beginning of the fall and we are starting a new sermon series today at The Bridge. We are gonna spend from now through Christmas exploring the book of Isaiah together. Isaiah is one of the prophets. Uh, as a church, we don't spend a ton of time in the Old Testament prophets. And I would say we spend even less time dealing with what is called the major prophets prophets. Those big books that are hugely intimidating, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, these are a challenge to average people, most of us in these days, because like they're ancient. They were written to different people in a specific context and we read them and it's unclear exactly what this means or what it applies to or when's that going to be fulfilled? Are we looking back? Are we looking forward? So these books are just intimidating. They can be confusing. They seem long and repetitive at different times and we get lost in the history and the context and the names and the historical background and the genre and everything. And so if you're like me, sometimes you read it and it's just discouraging. Like, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but the prophets, as challenging as they are, are actually deeply significant and rewarding because they, uh, these prophetic books in the Old Testament, I think give us a unique sense of what God is up to when our circumstances are really confusing. And, and maybe more than uh, any other books in the Old Testament, for sure, they give us a vision into who God is, what God's personality is like, what he values, what breaks God's heart, what makes God proud, what makes God angry. How does God communicate to his people? And so if we... If you and me are gonna be people who discern the voice of God and know the heart of God, we need to be people who are immersed in the prophets, in those who have spoken on his behalf to his people. Uh, and I'm becoming more convinced in my own life that I can't really understand the New Testament without a pretty good knowledge of the Old Testament prophets because the New Testament writers were immersed in the world of the prophets and they used the same images and the same language. And as the, the knowledge of the prophets comes alive, so does the New Testament come alive. And so uh, I'm excited about this challenge, even though we haven't really spent a lot of time uh, in the prophets together. If you were to read the whole New Testament and just jot down every Old Testament quotation, I think you'd walk away with a Sense that the book of Isaiah is enormously significant. Uh, scholars say that Isaiah is probably the most theologically rich book in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and so as we, as we look at this book, I, I'm excited about it. We're not gonna go verse by verse. That would take a really, really, really long time. We're gonna spend about four months and we're really gonna do like a survey um, and try to get a sense of what's the overall message of this book? How should we interact it? I'm praying that it leaves us uh, with more resources to listen to God's voice to us in the prophets uh, as a whole. And so we're, we're gonna end up in Isaiah chapter six this morning. So if you got a Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. If you don't have one, there's one in the seat back in front of you. We're on page 534 of that Bible is gonna be the main part of our passage today. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to take that one home and use in your own life. Um, but a few pages before that, here's how the book of Isaiah begins. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos. Vision, not visions, just vision. And that's interesting uh, because this book records a whole lot of different messages and experiences from this man named Isaiah, who was a prophet called by God. And yet they've been given to us in the form of 66 chapters here uh, in kind of a, a curated anthology of Isaiah's life, ministry, and, and his work. They've been carefully edited and compiled to, to portray an overall message that God saves sinners. And so we're gonna interact with this book. We're given the, the historical context in that opening verse two. He saw this concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So that's like the historical bracket. You can actually read about this historical period in the book of 2 Kings chapters 15 to 20. So if you're wanting to know what in the world is Isaiah talking about, that's really the place to start. That's the context that's going on. Uh, and so Isaiah ministers during the second half of the 700s BC. 
Uh, this was a time after the kingdom of Israel had split into two. There was like a civil war. There's the northern kingdom with 10 tribes and the southern kingdom called Judah uh, with two tribes. And during Isaiah's uh, ministry, when he started, it was actually a, a period of like prosperity. But um, the, the northern kingdom gets conquered by Assyria, which is like the, the biggest world power at the time. And the big question that Isaiah deals with throughout this book is what's gonna happen to Judah? The, the smaller southern kingdom, because the northern kingdom has gone into exile to Assyria. Is God gonna protect Judah? What's gonna happen to them? And, and who's, gonna, who's Judah gonna trust in? Are they gonna trust in the one true God? Or are they gonna trust in themselves? or in the surrounding nations, or in false gods. Uh, and, and Isaiah is continually calling the people back to faithfulness throughout his ministry. And so we're gonna kind of look at an introduction to this whole book in chapter six. We're gonna see the calling of Isaiah, um, the prophet. And uh, we're gonna see a vision of the God who calls. And with God and Isaiah this morning, we're gonna see really a pattern of how God deals with the world, how he calls all of us to himself. Uh, so so I is gonna, Isaiah is going to experience five invitations from God. And these five invitations God was giving also to the nation of Israel at the time. And as God's people, he's giving these invitations to us as well. And so I'm praying that he gives us ears to hear. So we're starting Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, that was 733 BC. Uzziah was a king of Judah. He reigned for a really long time. And it was one of those uncommon eras of prosperity and stability. During his reign, even the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom were real strong, real stable, and pretty prosperous. Uh, but his death marked the end of an era, much like the death of Queen Elizabeth this week. Like, Whoa, that changes a whole lot of things. We've never known a world like this. So when Uzziah died, it, it ushered in a new era of uncertainty and really a crisis of faith for the people of God. And Isaiah points out that though politically and economically, things are pretty good, particularly for Judah. Under the surface, there was an erosion of a foundation uh, that was gonna bring about calamity, destruction, and judgment. And so Isaiah's pointing to that. So I see this as extremely relevant to us today because the church, at least in our part of the world, for most of our lives, has been pretty prosperous and stable. But is it possible that under the surface, there are some foundational realities that we're forgetting or neglecting that could be causing this erosion in unseen places. So I think the voice of Isaiah is a gift to us in our moment. So this happened in the year that King Uzziah died. His moment was a lot like ours. And Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one of these seraphim called to, the, to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. How cool would that be to hear? And the house was filled with smoke. And so Isaiah is this guy who's been doing ministry through the reign of Uzziah. Uzziah dies. And he's at the temple in Jerusalem and he sees a vision. Hebrews tells us that the temple in Jerusalem was like a copy of the real throne room of God in heaven. And I think that God allows Isaiah to see what is always present, but normally hidden. He has this vision of the actual glory and presence of God. And Isaiah is attended by seraphim. These uh, seraphim literally means fiery ones. So there's these, they're these burning angels surrounding him and they've got hands, but they've also got six wings 
They're flying, they're covering their faces, they're covering their bodies. Though they're perfect, they don't want to be exposed to the holiness and glory of the one seated on the throne. And they're crying out over and over again this statement, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So the first invitation we see here is that God is calling us, he's calling Isaiah, but he's calling us too, to see him as he really is is to see him as he really is. God opened Isaiah's eyes to see a vision of God like Isaiah had never seen God before. And y'all, we are all prone to, to minimize or domesticate God when we think of him. And, and so God is saying, you need to see me like I really am. Isaiah saw the Lord and that vision changed his life forever. God revealing himself to us is the starting point for any meaningful change that will happen in our lives. This is what we need. We don't just need good information. We don't just need help with our problems. We don't just need better methods for dealing with them. We need to behold God as he is. Now, of course, we can't actually do that, right? Because our words, our thoughts, our imaginations are limited and he's not. And so we fall woefully short of beholding him rightly unless he intervenes and gives us the capacity to know him and experience him. Like everything we could come up with is too small. But what God is doing for Isaiah here in opening his eyes, he desires to do for us. He's willing to do for us. And so these seraphim are announcing God's holiness. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. And we know that in biblical literature, repetition means emphasis. So it's like exponential holiness here. Did you know that in the Old Testament, this is the only time an adjective gets stacked on itself three times like this. Language falls short to describe the beauty and glory of this one they are calling out to. He's holy, holy, holy. God's holiness is his otherness, his distinctness. Um, like we, we can't comprehend his holiness, but at the same time, we dare not forget the otherness and distinctiveness of God. The greatness of God really is the antidote to our tendency to drift toward a me-centered, temporal, reductionist life. We need to see him. And we need to listen to the, the call of these seraphim. It's amazing in scope. On the one hand, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. God is other. He's distinct. He's unique. There is no one like him. And the big theological word for this idea, theologians, theologians call it transcendence. It's this idea that God is apart. He is separate from creation. He depends on nothing else. He stands alone. So God is high and removed. And yet they also say the whole earth is filled with his glory. And so he's holy, high and above. And yet creation is brimming with the glory of God. The theological word for that is eminent. He is transcendent, he's high above, but he's eminent, which means he's close, he's near, he's knowable. He is within our grasp, as Paul says in Acts. He's closer than we can imagine. The created universe is filled with his glory. Y'all, all the people and the landscapes and the sunsets and the starry nights and the molecules and the atoms in the universe are humming with the glory of their maker. Though he is infinitely higher than we are, he's also closer than we know. Maybe you've had these moments in your life where you've experienced glory like for me, like looking at an ocean or like a mountain view or the Milky Way on a starry night or even into the mysterious deep eyes of an infant. We're in these moments where we're like 
invited beyond ourselves to commune with someone greater and someone glorious. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And yet we spend a lot of our time feeling cut off from that, don't we? Like, I'm just alone. And if God's out there, there's no way that I can know him or experience him. And I have this deep sense that I'm locked out or I'm cut off from him. But this announcement of the seraphim is that the greatness of God is actually pressing in on us from every direction if we will only have eyes to see. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, we have to know God, how he reveals himself to us, right? And Isaiah saw God as this vision in the temple. And maybe God will show himself like that to you. But he has also revealed himself to us perfectly in Jesus. Isaiah uses this language, I saw the Lord. Do you know the apostle John uses very similar language in John chapter one? Talking about Jesus, he says, we beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. To John, seeing Jesus was to see the glory of God. The author of Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact representation of God's being and God's nature. And that means that for those of us today who want to see God as he is, our starting point has to be Jesus Christ, the Son of God who reveals the exact likeness and image of God to us. But that's what we need. We need Jesus to open our eyes, to see him as he really is. Y'all, any lasting transformation that's gonna happen in our lives is gonna start there. With us, with us realizing God is way greater than we knew. That he's glorious and he's holy. And though he's high and exalted, he's close. And we can know him. But we read on. There's more invitations. Verse five. And Isaiah, seeing God, he says, Woe is me, for I'm lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah's first response to this greater vision of God is a truer vision of himself. That is the evidence of a true encounter with the presence of God. Think of Moses at the burning bush or Joshua outside the gates of Jericho or Peter on a beach with Jesus. All these men hit their faces and they say some version of, I don't deserve to be here. I don't belong with you. You are holy and I'm unclean and I'm not okay. That's what Isaiah does here. He sees God and therefore he sees himself. And any of us who are ever gonna make any eternal impact are gonna start here with realizing our own unqualification. I realize that's not a word, but we're not qualified. We're not okay. The second uh, invitation, God is calling us to see ourselves as we really are. So we gotta see him as he really is. And then he's saying, hey, I need you to see yourself too. I need you to look in a mirror. Many of us, this is essential for us, y'all. We think we're okay. We get dulled by the status quo and we compare ourselves to other people and we feel like, hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good compared to these other people around me. But against the backdrop of God's holiness, we always see we are tiny. We're defiled, we're lost, we're nothing. Or in the language of Isaiah, we're undone, untethered, floating free. Y'all, the, the, the result of a true encounter with this transcendent, eminent God is humility, undoneness. In the previous chapter, Isaiah has been pronouncing woes against the, the wickedness of Judah. He sees God, what does he say? Woe is me. I'm the lost one. So when we meet God, we don't start pointing our fingers at other people. We got to deal with our own brokenness. And that's what Isaiah does. Seeing God, he sees himself. And what he, what he sees first is the uncleanness of his lips. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
And that's not self-evident what he means here. Through the years, I've assumed that like Isaiah had a dirty mouth, like he cussed a lot or something, but I don't think that's what he has in mind here. Jesus said, out of the, the heart, the mouth speaks. And so speech, what we say is extremely important to reveal the state of our hearts. G, uh, Isaiah said, I, I live among a people of unclean lips. And we know the people of Israel were speaking flippantly about God as though God were ordinary and less than he actually is. We also know they were giving allegiance to false gods with their lips. But I think in context, Isaiah also means after seeing you, God, I realize that I have not spoken rightly about you. My words fall short of your glory and I am not qualified to speak as, uh, about someone as beautiful as you are. And so Isaiah, this one who's gonna be used by God to be a spokesman from God is brokenhearted over the sin of his speech. And God is gonna use that very area of failure to bring redemption and fruit through Isaiah's life. Isaiah's mess will become his message. And this God will do the same thing in your life and my life. Our great failures will be the platform with which he uses our lives to bring about his blessing and life to the world around us. He is inviting us to see ourselves, to come clean, to say, woe is me. That's how God plans to use us. Let's look what happens next. Verse six. So after Isaiah confesses, verse six, then one of the seraphim, these, these fiery angels flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he, and he said, behold, this from the altar has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And so what we see here is this God who blazes in glory turns out to be a God who forgives sin. Isaiah says, I don't belong here. My lips are full of sin. And God says, I can fix that. I know just what to do with that. So the third invitation here, God is calling us to be forgiven. This is incredible news. He wants us to see him. We have to see ourselves and we're not okay, but he's also inviting us to be forgiven. And the imagery here is real significant. They take a coal from the altar and the altar at the temple in Jerusalem was the place of sacrifice. So sinful men and women would bring animals to slaughter on this altar where there's a fire and God would accept the death of this animal as a substitute for the sin, the penalty that these people have committed for centuries and centuries and centuries. At the place of sacrifice, that's where the coal comes from that brings cleansing and forgiveness to Isaiah's lips. Now we're looking back through the centuries at this event, right? So we see it through the cross of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus on the cross changed everything. We're not sacrificing animals anymore because Jesus' death, a perfect substitute, counts as a once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world, for all who would hide themselves in him. And so what the angel tells Isaiah, that same assurance we hear from God in Christ. Here's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, woe is me, I am undone, I am unclean. If we do that, he is faithful, God is, and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What did the angel say? This has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. In Christ, our sins are forgiven, atoning is covering and your guilt is taken away, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Y'all, it's like Isaiah's sin never happened. And we have the same opportunity because of the perfect blood of Jesus. If you're in Christ, God is saying the same thing to you that the angel told Isaiah. The blood of Jesus has taken away your guilt and covered your sin. And the challenge for us now is to actually believe that and walk in that freedom. But this is the invitation. Come and be forgiven, be made new. You don't have to live 
with the burden of shame and guilt. I can take that away. Only God can forgive sins. But that's who he is and what he does. Verse eight. So having been forgiven, Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. So God's gonna send someone to speak on his behalf to the people of, of Judah. And Isaiah, fresh off this vision of God and clarity about who he is and a confidence in God's power to cleanse, he pipes up, uh, I can help. Like I'm here. Can, can you use me? God, I'll go. Like this is an incredible change. Verse five, woe is me. Three verses later, here I am. That's an incredible transformation. Only God can do that. But he can do that in us. He longs to do that in us. Isaiah says, I'm here. And it's really beautiful to me that Isaiah doesn't say, uh, could you give me a little more information? Like, what are the requirements? Like, what, what, what are the expectations? Can I have like a syllabus type thing of, of what to, no, Isaiah just says, yes, here I am, I'll go. He doesn't know where this is gonna lead. We know through tradition that because of Isaiah's preaching and his faithfulness to God, he was sawn in half. He was killed. But he said, I'll go. It's reminiscent of the disciples, right? They didn't know what following Jesus would mean. They just said, okay. They left everything and followed him. And of course, Jesus is calling us today, follow me. And the right response is, here I am. Send me. My answer is yes. Yes. If you can use me, Lord, please do. The fourth invitation, God is calling us to join in his work. He's like, I can use you right where you are. He's calling us to join in his work. Last week I heard Megan Causey say, and she was quoting somebody else, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And Isaiah would say yes and amen to that idea. God desires to use, use each of our lives to display his glory to the world. And we're all prone to think, he can't use me. Like I'm too weak, inconsistent, sinful, broken, short-sighted, selfish. We go down the list. But God does not require perfection from those who he will use. Instead, he, he requires a humility that, that forsakes our own greatness and rests in his forgiveness, his salvation. Like all of us have a list of reasons why we're not qualified to be used by God. But none of those are obstacles to God. They're resources. He will use those areas of weakness. He can use us. He desires to use us. So he's calling us to participate right where you are in your life with the resources you have right now, you can be used by God to reveal his glory and bring his blessing to the people around you. He is in you if you are in Christ. We don't need more. He can use you right where you are. He's inviting us to participate in his work. He, he then gives Isaiah like, some instruction and a preview of what's about to happen. And we're gonna finish out the chapter. Most of the time that that I've heard Isaiah 6 preached, preachers stop right here. Here I am, send me. It's a happy ending, that's great. But the New Testament actually quotes the end of the chapter at least five times. They're extremely relevant verses, even though they're challenging. Look what happens. Isaiah's like, I'll go. And then God says, go and say to this people, here's, here's Isaiah's message. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes, their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their hearts and understand or hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Like these are challenging verses, but they're really significant because it sounds like God is saying that he wants Isaiah to preach to these people so that they won't hear and won't see and won't understand and won't be saved, right? And something in me assumes God can't be saying that. And so I try to look at it from a different angle, but we have to be real careful not to twist the word of God. That's exactly what God says to Isaiah. Preach so that they won't respond. 
I'm going to bring judgment to these unfaithful people through you preaching truth to them. And did you know that Jesus gives a commentary on these verses? He actually reiterates the idea in Matthew chapter 13. He's explaining to his disciples why he teaches through parables. He quotes this text and he says it's the same way. That everybody who hears the word of God has a choice. How am I going to respond? And Jesus said when people refuse to listen, the understanding they have gets taken away. But when they receive the truth of God with with humility and joy, they actually receive a greater ability to hear more truth. And so let this serve as a warning to us, y'all. Every time we hear the truth of God, we have to respond. And the way we respond changes us a little bit. We're transformed. Every time we resist it or ignore it, we actually become more and more dulled to the truth of God's word. And that is a dangerous thing. But every time we hear it and we respond with gratitude and humility, we're changed and we're actually given more capacity to understand the beauty of the gospel and the truth of God. This is why the author of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. As long as it's called today, you have the opportunity to respond. So hear me. Don't put off obedience to God's word. Don't delay. You don't know when you will become hardened to the point of not hearing. God is speaking. And the question is, are we listening? So God, uh, Isaiah receives this mission with shocking clarity. God says, preach so that these people won't listen. How's that for a commission, right? Spend your life preaching a message that nobody's gonna respond to. (laughs) But it's a great reminder, like Isaiah and us, we are judged according to our faithful obedience, not according to results. Because God said, Isaiah, here's your task. It's not gonna work, but you're still faithful. And he's calling us to the same thing, faithful obedience to what's given to us. Um, God can use us flawed as we are to fulfill his purposes. Our greatest tool is a heart that says, here I am, send me. He's calling us to join in his work. There's one more invitation. We'll hit it quickly. Look at verse 11. And then Isaiah struggling with this says, how long, O Lord? Like, how long is this gonna last? And God said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And so God's saying, judgment is going to come to Judah. Jerusalem is gonna be captured and destroyed. The people are gonna be exiled to Babylon. It's gonna look like all hope is lost. Verse 13, and though a 10th remain in it, the losses are gonna be 90%. Though a 10th remain, it'll be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. So Judah is gonna be like a forest that's destroyed by the Babylonian army so that only stumps remain. And at that point, the stumps are gonna be burned. This is incidentally why our artwork for this series is a stump. It's central to the message that Isaiah is preaching. It's like a stump. They'll be reduced to that. But there's one more phrase in the chapter. The holy seed is its stump. That stump after judgment becomes a seed, a holy seed. And this idea of a seed has been a thread of redemption throughout the story of the Bible. Genesis three, the seed of the woman is one day gonna come and crush the head of the serpent and destroy evil. Genesis 15, the seed of Abraham would be the one who would bring God's blessing back to the nations. And here in Isaiah, the seed would sprout new growth out of the stump of Israel's failure and judgment. And so it's hope. So the fifth invitation, God is calling us to hope. Isaiah, it's gonna be hard. Destruction's gonna come, but God's not done. Ultimate redemption is coming. And the book of Isaiah is gonna explore the identity and ministry of this seed who we know now is Jesus, the Messiah. 
Like Israel's failure would lead to the coming of the ultimate redeemer. And y'all, that's our story too. Through our suffering and failure, God can bring redemption and hope and life. He'll even use those areas in our lives. So like Israel, we are looking forward to ultimate redemption when the Christ, Jesus, returns and rights every wrong. So there's a lot of trouble in this room. There's a lot of problems. Financial hardship, health crisis, relational breakage, wounds, anxiety, depression, fear, shame, the consequences of terrible decisions we've made. But as followers of Jesus, in all that, we can lift our eyes and see a distant light, hope. The holy seed is the stump. God's not done. God's purposes are not extinguished. So I'm excited about Isaiah. The story of Isaiah is that God brings salvation to sinners while judging sin. And that's the story of the gospel. That God in Christ bore the consequences of sin so that we who are in Christ could be saved. That's our story. God is inviting us to see him, to see ourselves, to be forgiven, to be used by him, to participate in his work and to have a hope that no circumstances can extinguish. This is the story of God's salvation in the world. And it can be the story of your life and mine. We're being invited into it. So let's respond. Let's pray.